Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Welcome back. Um, I have found my real purpose, which will for now be timekeeping. So from now on, I will make sure that we actually stick to time for, as, as scheduled. We are uh, seven minutes late, but we'll catch up. Now, welcome back. I hope you have decompressed, thought about everything that you've learned about decolonizing the academy and what the last 60 years, more or less, of independence has brought Africa in that, in that sense, in knowledge production. I've heard that the next talk will be, will, will tie into this very neatly, so if you had questions, you might still be able to raise them in the, in the last half. Our next speaker will be Birgit Meyer, who is a professor of religious studies at Utrecht University, a cultural anthropologist working on lived religion in Ghana. Professor Meyer studies religion from a global and post-secular perspective. She focuses on the rise and popularity of global Pentecostalism, uh, religion in general, public, popular culture, the media, visual culture, the senses, and aesthetics. Um, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Let's just... Yes, thank you for inviting me to speak at this conference to reflect on Africa's past since independence and its current state of affairs through the lens of my discipline and expertise. This means for me, a German-Dutch scholar trained in anthropology and religious studies who conducted long-standing research on Christianity as well as, uh, on, as, well as on uh, indigenous traditions and to some extent Islam in Ghana to speak, of course, about religion in Africa. However, I do not simply want to address the prominence of religion on this continent. So, sure. Um, I hope it... How do I uh, manage to make it uh, go on? <laughs> the green button should work. The green button doesn't work? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so... The clicker do the need. No. <laughs> No, it doesn't I only work. guess you have to press the green button. No, it doesn't work. No. Okay, well, I will just go on. Uh, so sure, uh, religion is uh, thriving uh, in Africa, as my recent visit to Ghana confirmed vividly once again. So the enmeshment of politics and prophetism, Pentecostalism and idolatry, traditionalism and high-tech media is puzzling and changes how religion is conventional, conventionally imagined in Europe. And I will turn to such phenomena later on, but not immediately. For first, it is necessary to address the conditions of knowledge production about religion in Africa and about Africa at large. 60 years after independence from European colonialism, and a bit more in the case of Ghana, coloniality has not vanished from the production of knowledge about Africa. There is an urgent need to remap our scholarly mindsets, and this means to acknowledge and identify the resilience of what Valentine Mudimbe aptly called epistemological ethnocentrism, which also plays out in the study of religion. His invention of Africa appeared more than 30 years ago, but even though the need to, what Chakrabarti called, the need to provincialize Europe in academic knowledge production about other parts of the world is often emphasized, much thinking about how exactly to decolonize our approaches, concepts, and curricula is still to be done. As a scholar born and living in Europe, I opt for a relational approach that takes into account the past and present connections between Africa and Europe. And given my positionality, my concern is not to reimagine Africa in indigenous terms from a time preceding the onset of colonialism as advocated by some current decolonial thinkers. Instead, I take a trans-regional perspective on past and present African-European entanglements and their repercussions for the production of knowledge in the past, the present, and of course, for the future. Africa is not what it is because of what it is like. Africa is what it is because of what the world is like and vice versa. So we study Africa to understand the world, as Elisio Macamo puts it aptly. 
The idea of studying Africa to understand the world in ways that transcend a still lingering Eurocentrism in favor of multipolarity also drives my own scholarship. Against this backdrop, I do not regard the study of religion in Africa as being merely about Africa, and I wonder ever more what religion in Africa actually is. The expression religion in Africa normalizes what should be questions. What do we mean by it? And how far does the study of religion in Africa always already presuppose a perspective from Europe? How to develop the study of religion in Africa in a critical and productive manner that does not confine it to a regional subfield, which scholars in the study of religion outside of African studies can even comfortably neglect? How to open up vistas to understand the world in the sense of Makamo through studying religion from Africa? The study of religion in Africa is a thriving field with researchers from Europe, Africa, and elsewhere. The flagship journal with the same name mainly consists of articles based on grounded historical and ethnographic research on a plethora of themes with Christianity and indigenous worship being the main religions considered, next to Islam and more recently religions from Asia. I appreciate this regional focus and I contribute to that field. But once one is inside, the focus on religion and the ways of studying it may easily be taken for granted. However, studying religion in Africa is not simply about Africa and cannot be fruitfully and critically addressed in the confines of just African studies. And in this section of my lecture, I will concentrate on the implications of the introduction of the notion of religion into Africa. The key question here is how religion, as a concept got to Africa and how its introduction affected African ideas and practices, uh, to, um, uh, practices um, by all this uh, scholar, scholarly, missionary and colonial um, uh, knowledge which try to refer to these ideas and practices. My point is then not uh, that what is referred to as religion in Africa should not be designated by that term and be replaced by indigenous ones. It is exactly by focusing on the use of the concept of religion, taken as an umbrella term that encompasses a broader vocabulary, that it is possible to gain a sense of how Africa is always already part of religious studies and how Africa and Europe are inextricably intertwined, even though this uh, is ill-recognized or at least from a European mainstream perspective, conveniently forgotten. Here I'm very much inspired by the work of David Chidester, who called to resituate comparative religion in the historical context of colonial conflict. As he pointed out in his book, Savage Systems, the human sciences, including comparative religion and anthropology, and their constitution as authoritative and eventually professional knowledge, disguise their origin in this reality of intercultural contact and exchange, even preventing any recognition that their foundational notion of the human depended upon the new interchanges of an expanding global order. Chivester traced the emergence of comparative religion back to the frontier zones of European colonial outreach in which intruders and indigenous people assessed, constituted and contested the concept of religion and related terms under unequal power relations. And as he put it ironically and succinctly, before coming under colonial subjugations, sub subjugation, Africans had no religion. After local control was established, however, they were found to have had a religious system after all. Offering evidence for indigenous religion as a low stage of the evolution of religion, this religious system was relevant for the comparative study of religion in the mid 19th century. His critical epistemological project of tracing the terms employed for the study of religion from the European centers back to the colonial frontier zones is well taken. It makes clear that studying religion in Africa is not simply confined to a conceptual space within Africa, but enshrines a long history of African, European, economic, social, political, and conceptual connections under unequal power relations. I agree with Chidesta that by tracing the history of such entanglements to the frontier zones in which European-African relations were shaped, it is possible that we might clear a space, perhaps even a post-colonial, post-imperial, post-apartheid space, 
where something new in the study of religion might happen. The wish for something new to happen underpins my question, what is religion in Africa, which in my view can only be answered satisfactor satisfactorily by turning to the relational dynamics through which Africa and Europe got and still are entangled. In so doing, I want to address two critical issues that more or less tacitly inform the study of religion in Africa and need to be spelled out. One, the difficulty of translation, and two, Africa's presumed religiosity. One, translation. How to analyze religion in a society in which the concept of religion is absent, Louis Brenner asked poignantly. As he points out, external European concepts de define what is meant by religion in Africa. This involves the use of a Christian concept of religion that emphasizes belief, knowledge, and church-like community at the expense of the practical dimension of people's encounters with gods and spirits. And these terms also appear to be problematic. Brenner's critique resonates with the point made uh, by uh, scholars as Talal Assad, Daniel Dubuisson, Jonathan Z. Smith, and others, that the academic study of religion is indebted to post-enlightenment Protestant views of religion that are mistaken as universal and thus tend to misrepresent indigenous traditions as well as Islam. This ill-realized indebtedness to European ideas about religion pertains to Western missionaries as well as to scholars. For instance, in my research on the activities of the 19th and early 20th century German missionaries in Ghana, I found that they represented the EVE, among whom they conducted their proselytizing activities and ethnographic research for the sake of conversion and for the sake of scholarship from a Protestant viewpoint. In his ethnographic work, Die Religion der Evea in Südtogo, the missionary Jakob Spiet typically started with the belief in a distant high god, Mahu, from whom the Ewe had become alienated and then moved to the many indigenous and foreign, um, uh, then to uh, religious secret organizations, to the belief in the soul, to sorcery, divination, and witchcraft. Relying on translated statements of Ewe informants, the book is a highly valuable resource. However, in opting for an order from high to low and from indigenous to foreign, Speed presented a normative view of actual evil religion as degenerated from its initial core and purity. This view resonated with a typical Protestant missionary view of African peoples having lost their link with the high God and the mission set out to relink them again. Obviously, the possibility to spot the misrepresentation of African ideas and practices that occurs by describing them through a European lens depends on tracing the work of translation through which certain associations and analogies were construed. In Eva, for example, the term that came closest to religion was subo subo, which could better be translated as worshipping or serving. Mawu was the real god the Eva were told to be looking for, and Sasabon Sam, the bush monster, became the devil who presided over the Trobo, whom the Eva falsely worshipped. These were powerful translations that drew Eva terms not only into a Christian vocabulary, but also into a narrative of degeneration and possible redemption through conversion. From a critical anthropological angle, the aim of translation is not to submit foreign terms to Western ones, thereby smoothing out differences, but to engage with differences. Translation and studying translation in this manner makes it possible to discern the coexistence of the known and the foreign in specific power relations. An open-minded translation of religion and associated terms and the tracing of past translations can spotlight alternative possibilities and break open the concept of religion as narrowly understood. Speaking about religion in Africa thus requires to invoke Deepesh Chakrabarti, the preparedness to provincialize a European take on religion in the light of alternative, alternative human spirit relations. As Michael Lumbeck argued in his article, Provincializing God, to provincialize God is to draw on European thought and yet at the same time to try to step outside the Abrahamic traditions to recognize how it has influenced secular thought about religion and to try to imagine how something like religion might look outside the Christian and Islamic spheres. 
He substantiated his point by turning to the newer religion as documented by Evans Pritchard, who tended to describe it in terms that betray his own Catholic orientation. Lambeck argued that translating the newer term quoth as God was problematic because this translation failed to capture the specific deictic manner in which, uh, in which quoth was speak, spoken about among the newer, not as an objectified God out there, but in an indexical manner that signals the presence of quot in relation to the speaker mentioning his name. So the problem of translation is not only the difficulty to find equivalent terms for God, the devil, or the Holy Spirit, as I also realized very much through my research, but also to convey equivalent semiotic relations between humans and spirits in modes of speaking. Taking a provincializing attitude to the translation of Western terms with regard to religion into African languages and vice versa recognizes that it would not be possible to speak about human spirit relations without these terms and yet acknowledges that they are inadequate. Backed by this insight, I opt, for I opt for approaching religion in Africa as an open project through which we can extend our understanding of religion by studying it from Africa. To reconsider what was lost in translation is all the more important as the concept of religion was part of colonial policy in regulating and at times policing ways of engaging with the spirit world and also has become part of post-independent state policies. Ghana, for instance, has a secular constitution in which, at least in theory, all religions, Christianity, Islam, and so-called traditional religion, even though de facto despised by Christians and Muslims, are equal, and their proponents enjoy the freedom of religious expression. The second point I want to uh, raise on, in this section concerns Africa's presumed religiosity. Notwithstanding the initial lack of African terms that could serve as an equivalent for religion, the term religion was successfully introduced across Africa. And nowadays, Africa often even features as a privileged site for the study of religion. Despite the fact that the term religion was of European origin, the idea of Africans as being profoundly religious was also embraced by quite a number of African scholars of religion, certainly many of uh, those in the ambit of Christian theology. Asserting the deep religiosity of Africans and tracing it back to what was termed African traditional religions, the work of scholars as Mbiti, Busia, Opoku, and Perinda resonated with the search for a pan-African personality launched by Nkrumah and Zenghor's project of negritude in the 50s, 60s. The assertions that Africans are above all religious beings was initially made as a critical response to the repercussions of earlier racist denials of religiosity to Africans in the 17th and 18th century and their characterization as being exponents of primitive and bad religion, idolatry, fetishism, paganism, black magic, with the onset of colonization and missionization in the 19th century. Assertions of an essential Africanness that is rooted in religion may be a source for pride and self-esteem, but also has certain problematic consequences. For it is one pole of a binary that opposes a view on Africa as religious to a view on Europe as secular. In the current global configuration, Europe has gone through a process of remarkable unchurching, with the Netherlands being at the vanguard uh, here, uh, on average, one church is closed down per week, and religion tends to be taken in the mainstream very much as a matter of the past and uh, possibly valuable as heritage, while in its living form, it is often seen as some kind of nuisance. For many here, religion connotes backwardness. Against this backdrop, the characterization of Africans as being notoriously religious transports once again a temporalizing idea of Africa as not yet secular and rational. And by the same token, for some Western Christians, Africa is made to stand for the future and hope of uh, Christendom, also supported by statistics provided by the Pew Research Center, and is regarded as a place from which what Adogame called reverse mission is unleashed to re-evangelize Europe. Europe has indeed become a mission era, 
uh, area for African Christians. And in Amsterdam, I often come across religious uh, African preachers, many of whom take this world as morally defunct, some kind of Sodom and Gomorrah. And my point is not to deny these activities, but to challenge the naturalization of Africans as religious and the taken for granted manner in which religious is understood from a European angle. Jan Plattfoot and Henk von Rinsem pointed out that the ontologization of Africa as religious purports a problematic, and I quote, mythic dichotomy of religious Africa versus secular Europe, which affirms a false opposition of us and them mapped on the religious secular distinction. Such a stance continues to produce Africa as Europe's eternal other, with the religion secular binary serving as the ground for their separation. An idea of Africa as still enchanted or as never secular is problematic not only because it denies Africa coevalness with secular Europe, but also because it affirms long standing exoticizing stereotypes. Maintaining this idea neglects that many modern states in Africa, as noted, actually do have a secular constitution and re relate to religion in a secular framework and stands in the way of exploring the implications of the introduction of the concept of religion into Africa for scholarship, governance, and everyday life. So the point here is that the study of religion in Africa is deeply influenced by the introduction of religion as a general concept to Africa that was increasingly appropriated by African converts to Christianity, Islam, and so-called traditionalists, policymakers, and scholars. Taking into account and making visible European colonial influences and their appropriation in the study of religion in Africa is an important step in developing a post-colonial perspective on global religious history and, in fact, in understanding the world. And now I come to the second part. What, and there will be three parts. The last will be very short. What then could studying religion from Africa mean? I do not have in mind a turn to an indigenous Africa stripped of Western ideas and influences. Even if this would be possible, it would not be an option I could take as a scholar trained in Germany and the Netherlands. I agree with the point stated way back in the 1970s by Ugandan scholar Okot uh, Bitek, whose work has not received the necessary attention it deserves in the anthropology of religion, that there is a need to get rid of the very disparaging assertions of Western scholars about African religious conceptions. For me, this also involved that Western scholars rethink their stances in studying religion in Africa. In his powerful book, he pointed out that African scholars who sought to move beyond colonial and missionary accounts of religion were trapped in these very ways of analyzing religion in Africa and failed to describe African religions in their own terms. This, of course, has to do with the fact that what was framed as religion in Africa was not confined to a separate domain in society and was grounded in entirely different conceptions than those prevailing in theological and scholarly approaches to religion in Christian and quite mentalistic terms. For Bitek, studying African religions in their own right could only be achieved through a decolonizing move that critically traces the history of the study of African religions in Western scholarship and seeks to develop alternative insights. For him, this meant to get out of the trap of speaking back in colonial missionary terms, and he urged African scholars to do this so as to develop a more truthful picture of religion in Africa. Disentangling, as Ghanaian philosopher Kwesi Viredu put it in the introduction to the reprint of Bitek's book, disentangling African frameworks of thought from colonial impositions is an urgent task facing African thinkers at this historical juncture. For him, this is the condition for rethinking the universal from bottom up rather than from the top down in the usual Eurocentric manner. My point as a Western scholar is that the study of religion is to be decolonized also in academia at large, and that I also have a responsibility and task in this endeavor of remapping our scholarly mindset. In so doing, 
I take as a starting point the entanglement of Africa and Europe under highly asymmetrical conditions and seek to develop, to invoke Bruno Latour, a symmetric anthropology, proposing to study religion from rather than simply in Africa, I want to signal the importance of taking an alternative vantage point for the study of religion rather than it being studied from Europe. And here I refer to Europe not simply in geographical terms, but as the claimed center for the production of knowledge about the world at large in the name of the universal. Even though colonialism has passed, the way in which we produce knowledge about religion still bears traces of the very same Eurocentric and Christian bias signaled by Bitek and by Kwasi Viredo in his introduction to Bitek's text. The expression studying religion from Africa, of course, resonates with the theory uh, from the South project launched by uh, the Komarovs. Thinking theory from the South, from Africa, does not aim to affirm the North-South binary, but is to lay bare the larger dialectical processes that have produced and sustained it. Studying religion from Africa, I would say with the Komarovs, invites us to see familiar things in different ways. So how does taking Africa as a vantage point allow us to see a presumably familiar thing as religion in different ways? Posing this question, I want to stress once again that my concern, at least for now, is not to do away with the term religion because of its Western provenance. Rather, I want to take religion as an open concept that has at its core the relations humans deploy with an unseen other world. It is a concept that is not yet fixed and filled, but still to be developed through research from Africa and other areas. Three important things come into view, which could be highlighted by the terms groundedness, openness towards the foreign, and relationality. One, groundedness. BTEC states, African religions are not so much concerned about the beginning and end of the world, they are rather more concerned with the good life here and now, with health and prosperity, with success in life, happy and productive marriage, etc. They deal with the causes of diseases, with failures and other obstacles in the path of self-realization and fulfillment. The point here is not to make an essentialized statement about what African religions really are, but to counter the ideology that underpins their misrepresentation. This misrepresentation was due to the fact that they have been described from a Christian Western mindset that was geared to an ontological difference between transcendent and immanent, spiritual and material, belief and reason. For this very reason, Viredo even suggests that the engagements of Africans with superhuman spirits should not be termed religion at all. But as proposed, I think that we can also take notice of such engagements to think about religion otherwise. In my recent work, I have developed an approach to religion from a material angle. The aim of this approach is not to reduce it to sheer materiality, but to recapture a crucial dimension of religion that has been sidelined by its Protestantization and dematerialization. Such a Protestantized understanding of religion, as noted, served as the yardstick to classify and hierarchize other religions, also in Africa, which was seen as a abode of idols and fetishes by missionaries and as a site of primitive religiosity by scholars. By critically analyzing the ideological use of such a notion of religion, its limits become evident, and by turning to, for instance, Africa, possibilities open up to see religion in a different light. In my research work on the operations of the Norddeutsche Missionsgesellschaft among the Ewe in what is present day Ghana and Togo, I noted that the missionaries were not only preaching against so-called heathendom and idolatry, but also purported a new mentality and possibilities for participation as producers, traders, and consumers in the modern colonial economy. In this sense, the mission was very worldly and mundane, even though the missionaries themselves did not like to acknowledge this in full and rather lamented about the materialism and lack of spirituality of their converts. The missionaries' descriptions of their endeavors above all they bear their own concerns and contradictions which arose from promoting conversion in a new colonial world of so-called legitimate trade that succeeded centuries of slave trade. 
reading missionary texts, including propaganda for the mission, as well as internal reports and ethnography from a critical angle, the ever emerge as very reasonable and calculating persons, both in their religious practices and their mundane activities. And in fact, it would be artificial to separate these. There are spirits in relation to all domains of life, but they are not understood as immaterial gods. They become material in certain places and through certain things at certain times, while at the same time these places and things are not always approached as being or hosting spirits. Rather than seeing this link between spirits and matter as an expression of animism or fetishism, it makes much more sense to say that for the ever, spirits, as Viredo also put it with regard to the neighboring Akan, are a regular part of the resources of the world. Indeed, if human beings understand how these powers function and are able to establish satisfactory relations with them, humans can exploit their own powers to their advantage. This certainly undermines conventional views of Africans as being deeply religious in the usual sense. It is a rather grounded, embedded, and to some extent instrumental religiosity that is not separate from what we now call economy, but inflected with it, in that spirits themselves are resources that feature in the allocation of other resources, which is how we define economy. As Hermann Krusbergen points out in a recent article, European scholars and missionaries failed to recognize these attitudes towards spirits as religion because they were adapted to a European concept of religion that took belief and community as key elements. Interestingly, according to Kruisbergen, Pentecostalism, which is often criticized as being a foreign Christian movement that is up against African culture and religion, brings back an African concept of religion without worship groups defined by an adherence to a particular picture of the world. I cannot go into the study of Pentecostal churches in any detail here, but I think that notwithstanding the strong criticisms Pentecostals have with regard to indigenous African religions, there are strong resonances between them. Certainly, the Holy Spirit is mobilized as a resource that allows to achieve other resources in a highly competitive world in which health and well-being are under siege and people feel anxious and insecure. This is important in moments of personal crisis, but also at threshold moment as New Year's Eve when numerous churches offer crossover events. These pictures taken during my regular visits to Ghana, which happened to be in early January, show the importance of such crossings and new takeoffs all over the city of Accra, year in, year out. Such a strong mobilization of divine power also occurs in the sphere of politics, of course, especially in election time, when politicians seek to back their power by linking up with all sorts of prophets who forecast victory, notwithstanding the secularity of the Constitution. Second here, the openness towards the foreign. Throughout my research, I have been fascinated by the Evers and other people's preparedness to accommodate new powers, ideas, and practices, a finding which, is not, which not only complicates a view of Africans as passive victims of missionization and colonization, but which is also is at odds with conventional representations of Africa as traditional in the sense of fixed and conservative. Tradition itself may rather be the ability to recreate and incorporate as the mediation of tradition through images from Hollywood in video movies or recent instances of traditional priests um, representing themselves as experts in voodoo and magic via Facebook and other uh, social media show poignantly. Or like this. This stance may well be an expression of the basic sense of incompleteness, which, as argued by Francis Nyamnyo, opens the door for connectivity and interdependence, active participation, mutual fulfillment and enrichment. It compels us as humans to broaden our perspectives, embrace the, known and unknow the unknown and unknowable, and to be open-ended, open-minded, and flexible in our identity claims and disclaimers. This attitude also fuels the literary style of Afropolitanism described by Achille Mbembe, SA Stylistics and Politics and Aesthetics and a Certain Poetics of the World. It is a manner of being in the world which refuses on principle any form of victim identity, which does not mean that it is not conscious of the injustices and the violence 
which the law of the world inflicted on this continent and uh, its people. As a style, Afropolitanism acknowledges hybridity and entanglements rather than insisting on a bounded purity and originality. It is a stance taken by people located in between worlds, directed by colonialism to set themselves in relation to a European center as other. In certain ways, this may, this may also even be an asset in our increasingly diverse world in which here in Europe, Alas, identitarian closures are called for ever more loudly. In my understanding, religion in Africa is about engaging otherness, spirits from the north, but of course also the Christian God, or we could think of uh, mummy water, and searching for new technologies to access such powers. This makes its study a prime resource for grasping alternative politics and aesthetics of religious world making and this is something we can really learn from our European uh, position, from um, people in Africa. Three, the last point of this section, relationality. Doing research among the Ever and working through missionary materials, I have always been struck by the strong idea of persons being connected with other persons and spirits. This, this shows a sociality of entanglement in which people derive their identity through connections. And connections may uh, be a source of trouble and mishap, as is the case with witchcraft, with witches being understood to have access to a person through blood ties or other intimate links. Connections with spirits also often occur through blood and family ties, but may also come about by receiving certain objects, consumer consuming food or having sex. In indigenous ever religiosity, much emphasis is placed on practices of binding for good and bad. In Pentecostal deliverance sessions, during which people come with certain afflictions, I often heard that people felt invaded uh, by forces from outside, which they felt to be harmful. During my research, pastors talked about the importance of cutting blood ties through deliverance so as to prevent spirits from invading a person. And people said that there was need to close themselves, for instance, by using Jesus as a hedge. Moreover, there are many narratives about illicit connections through which a person gets access to another person so as to extract his, her riches or to sacrifice him, her in exchange for money. I find this awareness of being connected and entangled with other people, spirits and things very intriguing. It is a different way of being in the world than stipulated by uh, modern Western models that emphasize individualism grounded in an idea of what the philosopher Charles Taylor called a buffered self. At the same time, it resonates with our global current engagement with so-called social media, through which people are embedded in various intersecting networks that are partly dangerous and partly promising, open up further possibilities. Against this backdrop, it is interesting to consider current internet fraud developing in Ghana, such as uh, Sakawa, through which young techno whiz kids link up with lonely rich people in the West to lure them into relations and obligations to, uh, to give, which is even shown in a, a globally uh, circulating, more upmarket uh, feature film, Sakawa, also shown at, uh, at ITFA. Some time ago, I still remember a nice sentence. The people in the film say, the stupid ones are always called Peter. So I found that really very <laughs> <laughs> So studying in a way, it, it, it was really, it's, it's quite interesting. I'm just beginning to think about relationality as a key angle for rethinking uh, religion, also very much inspired by a recent work by Eva Spies in uh, Bayreuth. Interestingly, uh, of course, this is already etymologically enshrined uh, in the term rel religion given that religare means tie, bind, and connect. So when studied from Africa, religion may well look otherwise than conventional European ideas suggest, spotlighting its groundedness in the world, its openness to the foreign, and its occurrence in a web of relations. The last section, studying religion from Africa in Europe. Studying religion from Africa is even more important at a time in which many Africans come to Europe as refugees and migrants. In fact, European metropoles may well be described as the new uh, frontier zones in which religious and other differences are negotiated. While people hailing from Africa know a lot about the long-standing entanglements between Africa and Europe, over here many people have no clue about them. 
For the broader public, the colonial history is neglected or simply forgotten, and it is barely realized that Europe too is in a post-colonial era, taking seriously the effects of past entanglements on the here and now is a sine qua non for understanding and intervening in the world in a mature human manner. In my view, scholarship on Africa has the task to unpack these entanglements and connections and to spotlight traces of the colonial past and remnants of coloniality in Europe. One important and interesting way of doing so is to study objects assembled in colonial times in Africa as well as in other zones of colonial outreach. Such an endeavor speaks to the current concern of museums to critically rethink their collections and the provenance of their objects in the light of calls for uh, their repatriation and uh, restitution to Africa. And I just remind you of the much discussed report by uh, Savoy and Saar. Many of these objects have been classified as religious and therefore expertise in the study of religion in and from Africa is important to understand their trajectory across the entangled African-European colonial history and its aftermath. I have just embarked on a new research project that focuses on a collection of Legba figures, so-called fetishes, and Jokawo, a collection of charms, assembled more than 100 years ago by missionaries of the Norddeutsche Mission among the Ewe and given to the Übersee Museum Bremen, formerly the Städtisches Museum für Natur, Völker und Handelskunde, and then later also called Colonial Museum. These objects are particularly interesting as most of them have been discarded by their previous owners who converted to Christianity and were expected to get rid of them. So the objects were packed and classified as fetishes and charms and started a new life as ethnographic exponents of every religion, which the missionaries regarded as idolatrous and scholars as primitive in the colonial museum. The objects underwent reclassification as the term fetish came to be found embarrassing and most of, after independence, eh? and most of them are tucked away in the underground depot or in the Schau Museum, Schau Magazin of the Übersee Museum. For me, these collections are fascinating instances of religion from Africa in Europe, literally. Analyzing their trajectory and the change of meaning and valuation they underwent also requires a critical analysis that takes into account how their original use and value for the Ewe was overlaid by European classifications such as fetishes and charms, and later on, uh, simple ethnographic objects to be kept and protected by the museum. They invite us not only to find out about their or original use and function, as well as the powers vested in them, but also to explore their conversion into idols and into fetishes and charms, through which they became specimen of hierarchically ordered types and stages of religion. During my really very recent trip to Ghana, I just came back uh, uh, last Friday, I presented a set of pictures of Legba figures in Jokawo, which I had received from the curator Silke Seibold to Ewe priest Christopher Vonkujovi. In his shrine, Legba figures are alive and kicking and they are fed and all that. And uh, Vonkujovi was highly surprised that these objects had been kept in a museum in Bremen for more than 100 years. And he very much wondered about the circumstances under which they had been given away. He also thought that these objects were still containing power and probably were very, very hungry as they had not been fed for very long. And they might want to come back, but as such objects are seen by many Christians as dangerous fetishes and idols from which they are to stay aloof, he could not imagine the Ghanaian government to come in and ask for restitution. It remains to be seen how a close study, um, not simply of the objects as such, but of the stations of their trajectory, will allow a critical study of religion from Africa that will prompt us to rethink the notions of what uh, W.T. Mitchell called bad objecthood, such as fetish and charms. They are matters from the past to be remembered in the here and now. And in any case, as this example shows, European museums contain a great deal of such colonial objects, which are uh, pressing matter, we could say, with Wayne Modest and, in fact, Peter Pels, uh, Wayne uh, and I, we are also working on a larger, uh, bigger project uh, that will address uh, missionary collections, uh, hopefully in 
uh, museums uh, uh, here in the Netherlands. So, which are pressing matter that enshrine colonial entanglements and ask to be unpacked by a collaborative effort that involves African and European scholars. So many of my colleagues in Ghana in archaeology, for example, African studies and so on, as well as curators and priests. Missionaries also, if there are still some around. Okay, so to conclude. So, what is religion in Africa? I hope to have conv conveyed to you that this is not a straightforward question and that there is no simple answer, for the question itself is already embedded in a historical frame that exceeds Africa. Religion in Africa must be traced to the connection with Europe through which religion was introduced as a concept in the first place. Rather than discarding the concept as foreign, I argued that it is more productive to investigate what religion might have been in the past and could be in the future by focusing on the repercussions of the introduction of the concept and related terms into Africa. Through inadequate and uh, imperfect translations, new possibilities for conceptualization uh, of uh, religion may arise that exceed the problematic Christian bias from which it is usually studied. In this sense, we could say, albeit provisionally, that looked at in and from Africa, religion appears as down to earth, open to the foreign and grounded in relational webs, and thus as a modality of being in and relating to power in the world that cannot be contained by concepts such as belief and church community. Religion in Africa cannot be captured by, and at the same time challenges, the epistemological ethnocentrism that has long informed its study. It is something else, and what it might be can only be answered through joint efforts of African and Western scholars. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for, yes, there's also a little book there. Yeah, for, for sort of, to my mind, giving hands and feet to what decolonizing the concepts might mean and what that might look like and how difficult that is, and for the wisdom that the stupid ones are called Peter and that the fetishes are hungry. Um, there will also be a discussant. Rijk van Dijk is an anthropologist and professor of religion in contemporary Africa and its diaspora at the African Study Center and a guest professor um, at the University of Constance. Professor van Dijk is an expert on Pentecostalism also globalization and transnationalism, migration, youth, and healing, and has done extensive research on the rise of Pentecostal movements in the urban areas of Malawi, Ghana, and Botswana. And it will come to no surprise to anyone uh, that, that they know each other. So I, I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing this exchange. Thank you. Professor Van Dijk. Uh, thank you very much for this nice uh, introduction of, uh, of myself, and it's uh, great to be here. It's always nice to, uh, to, uh, to hear Birgit uh, speak and be exposed to her uh, broad-ranging uh, ideas, and uh, it's also so nice to see that this is linking up uh, so greatly with the, uh, this, uh, this morning's uh, session. So I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, uh, issues for further uh, debate in the next half an hour. Uh, well, Bigot has taken us on a journey into the world of religion and its study, and how this entire field has been marked by particular European and African interactions and engagements. Myself being appointed at the Leiden University Chair of the Study of Religion in Africa, I'm of course happy that she has decided to not do away with the term religion, otherwise I may have lost my job but that she argues for its reconceptualization. She argues so in view uh, of the need for a decolonization of the understanding of religion, a move away from a singular European colonial and missionary grasp of the subject matter. She is calling for a theory from the South in which there is room for seeing familiar things in new and different ways. There are good reasons to maintain and expand a study of religion in and from Africa, as it is a domain in which there has been a long history of European-African interactions, a domain that allows us to develop a multipolar 
perspective in which Europe itself becomes decented and becomes perceived from new vantage uh, points. Religion and the study of religion in this sense becomes an open concept and project in which no a priori positions vis-à-vis -vis a claimed superior understanding of the world of supernatural and unseen powers can emerge. What Birgit has been arguing, in my view, is that in studying and explaining and interpreting matters of religiosity, both in Europe and Africa, we are all learners on an equal footing, without any need to accuse anybody of epistemological ethnos ethnocentrism, as long as the incompleteness of our joint understanding of what religion is, is held up high. In addition to this, Birgit also calls for our attention to what the long dominant European biased understanding of religion has actually done to how religion in and from Africa came to be depicted. Africa has often been rendered as a deeply religious uh, uh, continent and therefore being placed uh, as being the ulterior other vis-a-vis a secularized Europe. A falsely acclaimed secularism that at the same time equates religiosity with inferiority and backwardness. Also the European dominance in placing African religious expressions, notions and objects in the perspective of tradition rendered them as being inferior, dangerous or suspect, especially in the missionary views of an onward march of civilizations. Hence, African religious objects became classified and reclassified as fetishes, stripped of their power, submitted to the regimes of museum collections and their displays. Bigot's interesting new project will look into these museum collections as part of a fascination for the ways in which there is an important material dimension in how religion in and from Africa is manifesting itself. Less an understanding of religion in a Protestant fashion, as if everything religious needs to be of a transcendental nature, she points out how a religion is highly this-worldly and imminently oriented. This fascination has also been part of a long-standing research in all, into all the manifestations of religion that are catching the eye. Her much acclaimed work on religion and arts and religion and the media that I'm also greatly indebted to is truly significant here. After all this praise, I would also like to open our discussion with Birgit on the significance of religion in the context of celebrating 60 years of independence of Africa on three accounts, i.e. a kind of holy trinity in the way we may profitably engage with her thinking. These three are, firstly, secularism as a non-European invention. Secondly, religion and independence and the question if religion is diminishing or enhancing dependencies in and of Africa. And thirdly, the politics of religion as a driver of change. Let's turn to the first question, which is about secularity in Africa and forms of African secularism. Do they exist? And if so, what is their present day meaning? Birgit effectively debunks the European biased understanding of religion and calls for an open-ended, relational and incomplete notion of the term of religion and all the baggage that comes with it. This she does so as to make room for a theory of the South, a decolonized understanding and exploration of religion. The question is, are we not supposed to do the same with the notion of secularism? How can we assume that secularism is a purely European Western invention? And allowing on the one hand for a debunked notion of religion, yet maintaining a highly biased notion of secularism at the same time. I would argue that secularism, skepticism and agnosticism are not strange to Africa. And that we may need to move away from the notion that Africa is notoriously religious. If we make room for the idea that there are multiple secularities, 
Europe will need to be de decented again, so as to allow for the fact that secularism may take on other cultural forms and expressions than what we see in Europe. While in Africa we might be blinded by the omnipresent success of especially the highly mediatized Pentecostal churches, we can at the same time note a rising concern about religion and a distancing from it among especially the younger as well as the more educated parts of the population. So how do we see a theory from the South about secularism? The second point, especially in the context of celebrating independence in Africa, is what kind of dependencies and independencies is religion creating? While independence is understood first and foremost in political terms, economists are convinced that Africa's dependencies on foreign aid and foreign markets have far from dwindled. In the religious domain, we can see a different process of new dependencies emerging, much as retrenching African nation states increasingly leave important social services to the care of religious groupings and organizations. A huge civil society sector has therefore emerged consisting of all sorts of FBOs, faith-based organizations, that render a full range of social services to the population on the basis of their religious constituencies and convictions. On the basis of this so-called FBOization, national governments all over the continent have increasingly become dependent on religious players in the provisioning of such uh, things as healthcare, AIDS treatment, orphan care, schools, and in the recent years, even the establishment of religiously based universities. In addition to social support provisioning, I would also argue that on the level of private lives, intimate relations, individual prospects, and this decision making, dependencies on religious leaders, pastors, counselors, and teachers has also greatly increased. Not the least because of the enormous growth of Pentecostal churches or Islamic reform movements. While in colonial years, much of the awakening of independent African leadership developed because of the rise of independent African Christianities, religious schooling and prophetism, nowadays religion seems less about fostering independence and instead produces ever-growing dependencies on often formidable religious players. I myself have contributed to a re recent publication that explored the moral and disciplining effects that result if and when communities accept the services provided by these FBOs. The book is tellingly entitled Strings Attached. The third point for discussion might be that while we may superficially assume that because religion is producing more instead of less dependencies, it may stifle social change. The question is if we can jump to such a conclusion. Birgit's paper fruitfully demonstrated the enormous creative capacity that seems to mark religious traditions as being sources of continuous innovation. Yet, this being the case, the question thus becomes what the driver of change religion in and from Africa precisely is. And once we assume that, is a, that it is a driver of a particular sort, what kind of changes do we then see happening? For one, religion in and from Africa is definitely not without conflict. Too often we can hear reports of violent clashes, of attacks by fundamentalist and radicalized groups, and of maltreatment by certain religious groups of sexual minorities and such and similar. The record of religious developments in Africa simply is not a happy one. And yet some other religiously inspired developments are truly remarkable, such as, for instance, a Pentecostal church in Accra opening the first Pentecostal gym in Africa, 
being inspired by the idea that while the Bible says your body is your temple, it also requires to be well kept as such. Or the development of syncretic Christian Islamic groups, now known as Chrislam. If we were to meet 60 years from now, which important changes in African societies will we be able to attribute to a religious factor? Would Birgit agree with my speculation that there are signs that tell us that increasingly religious groups are indeed beginning to contribute to new ideas about a healthy body, a healthy society, and even a healthy environment? A growing ecological awareness of which we are seeing the first shimmering of how and why religious groups are getting increasingly concerned, take up issues about land, fertility, clean water, and a better environment, i.e. new responsibilities promoted in new religious agendas. Yes, thank you very much for raising even more questions and for giving the wonderful example. It's a, it is a no-brainer, the Pentecostal gym. We should, they should have thought of that ages ago. It's totally, yeah, born again, right? I mean, it, okay. The um, questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll take two each. Maybe you, you want to respond quickly first? Yeah, and you take the time to rethink your questions, preferably one or two sentences. Keep them very short and very to the point so we can get through as many as possible. Yes. Yes, uh, th thank, thank you, Rag. And in a way, we often move uh, together, and it's it's really very good that you uh, pose these uh, these questions, which I all find very um, important. The first, it is quite surprising in a way that, given the fact that there is so much attention paid to secularism and secularity in the study of religion, but also in political sciences, and so Africa is somehow a white spot uh, uh, in this, which I think has to do with this mistaken idea that Africans are so religious that, uh, as Charles Taylor said, uh, it is a kind of uh, still enchanted world, or Tanya Luhrmann, who did research there, also never secular. This is totally wrong, as also um, Matthew Engelke has pointed out. And I see that there are two things that need to be done. One is to spot what you said, uh, in a way, uh, an African secular in uh, colonial times. And this may require a lot of detailed uh, historical research, of course, because the point is not simply that people are skeptics, but to find out how on the level of governance there are distinctions and differentiations between those in charge of a spirit world and those in charge of other matters. And I do think that we can certainly find uh, uh, indications for that. A second question, of course, also in, uh, concerns the ways in which secularism as a system not for abandoning or banishing religion, but regulating religion works in Ghana and in other countries in the, the context of a democratic uh, constitution. Just a week ago, uh, Samuel Tevusu, who is also here, invited me to give a lecture at African Studies, and actually I did talk about this topic. I would have a lot to say about that, but here I wanted to do some groundwork to get rid of this idea of the African as always religious and thus prone to voodoo, afraid of witchcraft and all these colonial stereotypes. Religion is around, but it's very different and we really need to find out and, and, and listen what it is about. So that was my point here, but I agree, maybe we can do something on that uh, uh, together, right? So that would be uh, a very, very uh, important thing. <laughs> then the sec second thing, so, yeah, I, what, what I see uh, very strongly, also now in, in Ghana, I'm still under the spell of my um, stay there, faith-based organizations, of course. In Ghana, you have a kind of geopolitics uh, uh, on the national level, and it is not only American and European uh, faith-based Christian organizations that are very active and have certain programs. It's, of course, all kinds of groups from the Middle East, not at all uh, uh, friendly with each other. So the Iranians are active, Kuwait is active, Saudi Arabia is active, and it's not just about building mosques, but building hospitals, uh, and all that. So far, I notice also in the Medina project with which you are familiar, that people on the one hand tend to emphasize their religious identities as Christians, as Muslims, but still manage to live together. But I'm more and more concerned about the impact of all these uh, larger groups, uh, these faith-based organizations that do many things for the common good, also because the state seems not able to deliver the goods. 
and I wonder so, uh, yeah, whether we might expect in the future many more uh, clashes. We see a stronger, it ha all has to do with structural adjustment, privatization of state services, and it is uh, faith-based organizations that step in, very different ones, so that you can expect and already see all kinds of clashes, like wearing hijab is now a big thing. Many more Muslim women uh, insist on wearing hijab, and there is a very, very strong uh, protest against that on the part of Christians. So you see all kinds of polarizations that we need to follow very, uh, very closely. For the last question, I always find it very difficult to, to pin down, say things like religion is good or bad and so on. It will be many things, and I see indeed these positive um, uh, developments in a certain ways, but I also see very weird uh, processes uh, of radicalization, also particular kinds of pastors. There was a video shared, I hope it's a hoax, but I don't know, of a pastor who would sit in a bath tube and then make people drink his bath water and this kind of thing. So it is just a very uh, difficult uh, setting. I find it very difficult to forecast. Samuel Tevusu, I smiled at you already, Samuel, asked me something like the same. I think religion is a human thing because people seek to transcend them themselves, seek to connect, and they are always busy with their mundane affairs and their whereabouts, so somehow religion will be with us, but how exactly it will be shaped, I find very difficult to tell. It will depend a lot on, indeed, of the, of the power also of the state uh, to achieve and manage uh, uh, citizenship in ways that people can claim their rights, uh, basic rights uh, for subsistence uh, and all that. If not, well, we may fear quite a wild uh, world. Reason all the more um, to study this uh, uh, closely and uh, critically. And yes, Reich, always when we meet, we say we should write a piece about the limits, in a way, of Pentecostalism and all kinds of ways we should really do that, yes. So this is a <laughs> quick, as quick as possible uh, answer. Beautiful. Questions? All the way in the back, let's start there. Ah, well. <laughs> yes, uh, it's Ferdi again. Good afternoon. Um, Professor Birgit and uh, Professor Rijk. I'm a member of the Dutch Indonesian Protestant Church in uh, the Netherlands. The churches in, for example, South Africa have an important social and well-being well task or the diaconia in the community. What can we learn from the diaconia in Afri Africa? Do we have some tips? We have almost an empty Protestant church with 20 members. <laughs> <laughs> Concrete question. Um, there's, yeah, there's one up, up front here. And then we'll, we'll take more. Yeah. Um, um, it's Carolyn Hamilton, and I'm a visitor from South Africa, from the University of Cape Town. Um, Birgit, you made a methodological move in the second part of your presentation that took my breath away, and I, I want to lift it out and then ask you to comment on it. So you, um, you set up Weredu's challenge for us, the, um, the disentangling of African frameworks of thought from colonial impositions. And then you talked a little bit about David Chittiston. In a sense, if you like, David Chittiston's work winds the spindle backwards. So he unentangles and he gets us back to the colonial frontier where the project, to some extent, stalls. What I thought you did, which was really breathtaking, was you wound the spindle forwards. And if I understood you correctly, you said that an examination of the repercussions of the introduction of religion the particular forms it's taken and its trajectories in Africa until the most recent is so distinctive, particular, um, extraordinary, that in, it, in and of itself, that winding forward of the spindle shows something about those frameworks of thought, how they've played out into the future from the moment of the imposition of the concept of religion. I found that extraordinary. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about it. Go ahead. Do I have to take two questions? No, I'll take two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. Okay. Well, for the first question, oh. uh, it is very difficult uh, uh, for me to give any advice. As a scholar, I, uh, sorry, as, as a scholar, I just uh, study these uh, uh, processes. So, alas, uh, 
I cannot really uh, help. I think the difference very much has to do with the fact that religion is situated here differently, that it is lived differently uh, than in an African context where it is so much more enmeshed uh, with the search for health and, uh, and well-being. But uh, I, I, I cannot say uh, what is to be uh, learned there, unfortunately. Maybe Reik has an uh, idea. And then to... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Reik knows better about these things. And to Carol, thank you very much uh, for, for picking this uh, up. I'm, I'm indeed very much uh, inspired by David Chidester's uh, work for the call to look at this frontier zone as a zone where differences are being made and established and categorizations that have a long afterlife in uh, scholarship on religion have been formed. So I believe that this tracing back is incredibly important and that is very much what he does. He does not do uh, much anthropological work uh, on uh, how religion is lived, although he did some work on wild uh, uh, religion, but it, I think it was a bit uh, uh, armchair, which I also um, value. I found Viredo incredibly um, interesting, but I could not go entirely with him because uh, I do not want to give up, maybe for the same reasons, partly as Reich said, the term of religion. I really want to recapture, in a way, religion as a possibility of a kind of um, meeting point for scholars, uh, indeed, from Africa and here, uh, understood in ways that we don't really uh, know yet, what we really do not yet have a full clue about. So for me, this really refers to a very, very hard work to be done in our discipline, a discipline like religious studies in which I moved, which has nothing to do with Africa. So now I try to bring in Africa not as a regional nicety, but as a conceptual necessity, because I think we can only develop a notion of religion for the future if we take seriously and scrutinize the trajectories of the introduction of this notion conceptually and politically into eras as uh, Africa, Asia and Latin America. So for me, this is a trans-regional project, which indeed ends for now in saying we don't know exactly what it is and how we have to... Uh, uh, see it, which is maybe also not entirely satisfactory if one would work from a very strict idea of science where you have to know uh, what you are, uh, how you would feel your concepts. But I do believe that this is a moment which requires decolonization, spotting coloniality, and it requires transregional uh, encounters and debates about what we mean by religion. And we may end up differentiating it, but I still hope we, we do it in a way that we talk to uh, each other. So that's what I would say uh, about this for now. More to be said, I guess. Rijk, any advice? Um, okay, to come uh, back to the first question. I, I would be happy to, to join uh, uh, Professor Lunguzilov this morning, who said, well, perhaps academics are, the, are, are, are sort of the worst place to, to give advice on, on anything. Although uh, you might want to speak to my director in terms of uh, the hiring me in uh, the hourly rate that might be, uh, <laughs> might be there in that for that uh, purpose. In, in, in the African context, this idea of how African, uh, how churches, especially churches, are placed in offering forms of uh, social support by that you are uh, referring to, it, as I also indicated in, in my, uh, my discussion of Birgit's paper, is an increasingly important factor because of the, the fact of uh, retrenching uh, state uh, structures of, uh, of social support, whether this, this provisioning of forms of so social support can be used as a as a kind of missionary strategy to win the hearts and souls of increasing numbers is yet to be uh, yet to be seen, of course. But it's definitely a factor of uh, of importance. In, in terms of the of the second question, I think what we can also learn from the work of Chidesta is that there is a particular ways in which this uh, this let's say this throttle this this idea of how things are pushing forward into a, a, a new future. Uh, that he has also been uh, been pointing at in his work it has got to do with the ways in which also particular forms of uh, of let's say the, the plural of christianities have been forging um, certain forms of uh, what me and, and, and a number of colleagues are calling legacies of aspiration of the ways in which through this whole mode of these forms of religious organization certain ideas of an aspirational future of things that can be reached at some point in, in, in future, 
uh, also create a legacy of for, them, for themselves, drive people into particular forms of, uh, of social behavior, of forms of, uh, of organization. This has been particularly inspirational for a whole new domain in uh, anthropology as well, which has become called the anthropology of hope. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, Caroline, I want to add one um, small thing that just uh, came up. I said in my lecture that I think that the European metropoles can may well be seen as the current frontier zones in which differences are being uh, negotiated and in which we find so many repercussions of colonial um, stereotypes. So what I also see as one way forward is to, in a way, move into the field of those studying religion in the Netherlands and to diversify it. I think as scholars who have expertise on uh, religion in Africa and who want to think it from Africa, we are much more to involve in these debates in Europe, to also, in a way, uh, de-emphasize this quite stupid idea of Europe being somehow grounded in a Judeo-Christian uh, uh, tradition and being really something for white people originally and all that. What we face now are the repercussions of very, very long-standing colonial entanglements of our wealth comes from there. And I really think as scholars, in African studies, we should definitely not stay in African studies in the sense of an area, but to bring in a way the idea of Africa, the way it was invented to bear on contemporary debates and injustices. Also, if you see how African people are represented, it's not only that Muslims are represented in, in quite problematic, often Islamophobic ways, there's also a certain way of representing Africans. It's always the voodoo and whatever thing, or the witchcraft and so on, or irrational and so on. This is really problematic. And I believe with this study of religion, in a way, also towards the future, we have to bring in our expertise on the study of religion and many other things from Africa into Europe. The African Studies Center is not at the margins of the university. It's not about area studies. It's at the center of debates which are about how to live and coexist in a world of diversity. And so that is, then it come, becomes almost also a political, yeah, it is a kind of political um, knowledge uh, project. And I, I really think we need to go there. For very long, I, when I spoke about Africa, people said, huh, what? Do we really need to hear about Africa? Now I think we just must to talk about talk with our expertise here. Let's talk about Africa all the time. It matters to so many things that are being debated. It's not marginal. It's not somewhere else. It's here. That'll be the slogan to take away from today. Let's talk about Africa all the time. The uh, more questions, but can I see all of them? Just to, well, that's not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there, I see a hand there. Louise Muller, um, I have a question for uh, Professor Meyer um, on this, um, what in the colonial time they used to uh, call fetish uh, objects, because I wonder if now you're, well, in museums also in Europe are um, in the process of decolonizing these objects, uh, are there not also at the same time, politics against this decolonization <laughs> going on, because these objects, as I used to learn when I was uh, conducting fieldwork in Ghana, they are very valuable in museums in Europe. So the more blood has flown and the more animals have been killed, and so in Africa, the more it is really valued in the market as a fetish object, so the more museums has pay for these um, so-called artworks. So how, what are you planning to do um, with this uh, part of the, yeah, the object-subject discussion in African arts at the moment? And then there was Maike. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for your engaging talk, both of you. Uh, and I support most of what you said, but I think there is a need to provincializing Europe further. Because I'm happy that the Islamic groups came up when you're talking, both of you, about the kind of contemporary observations. But I think it's, it's quite problematic if you uh, analyze history in terms of religion in Africa and you only restrict yourself to uh, European colonialism uh, in Africa and not pay any attention to 
African connections to the Islamic world. Also, if you look, for instance, if you try to uh, analyze the, the emergence of the idea of um, religion, I think it's important to also look at these other connections. Um, and of course, you, you mentioned Islam some, so at some point, but I think it's very important to really include it in the analysis because it really may change things. And also, if you look at the contemporary <coughs> connections, of course, if you look at um, uh, Pentecostal movements from Brazil to Africa, it, it's different from, if you look, oh, it's all Christianity, that is all our heritage. So I think, yeah, in this kind of terms, it's very important to have a real broader view. If you could be reasonably concise in your answers, we can add one more question. Anybody? Yeah, one more, last, yeah, that seems. Ah, yeah, you're, the ch you're in the challenging position, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Naomi van Rijn from the Free University of Amsterdam. Uh, I have a question about, um, well, talking about the theory of the South, um, I think uh, should not be the first step for the academic world to engage more um, and to be more open to epistemological epistemologies uh, that are grounded in religious worldviews, whereas uh, most social theories nowadays uh, find their origin in secular epistemologies. That was a nice one. <laughs> Yeah, well, these are all really very uh, interesting questions. So, uh, Louisa, your question about uh, so-called fetish uh, objects and the decolonization of the museum um, through uh, provenance research and all that. I find it important um, to realize that, of course, there are very different uh, kinds of objects with very different values. And while Nkisi figures uh, from Congo are highly valued, the Legwa figures, in a way, are sleeping they are, they are not claimed, they, are, they have never been uh, framed as pieces uh, of high art, which makes them very interesting to me. They were given away by, by people who converted to Christianity, otherwise they would have been burned, and then the missionary brought them there as a collection, and they are in a bad shape, uh, many are not. You, you may have seen that on that uh, slide, and so on. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's very important, and actually we are trying to develop a project around that with Wayne Modest and other people from the museums and from um, anthropology and other fields to develop a project to look at, indeed at uh, museum uh, collections as part of this uh, decolonization. I think that sometimes simply uh, this call, we must restitute everything although I'm not, not necessarily against that, it's a bit uh, short-sighted and quick. I think it is very important to get a clear idea of um, the provenance of the collections and the conversions which objects underwent, and I think this requires a lot of joint research. I just have been to Ghana, as I said, and I want to work, uh, it's in a way my next project there, want to work together um, with uh, scholars in African studies and archaeology, to get uh, a deeper uh, idea of these uh, um, uh, objects, how they came there and what their future um, uh, might, uh, might be. Um, then the question of the provincialization uh, of Europe. Of course, this is uh, uh, absolutely, I agree with you, but I thought that I wanted, given that the study of religion is so much indebted in a way to Christian understandings, uh, I thought that it is uh, okay for the time that I have to focus on that. Of course, I have been very much inspired in my work by Talal Assad, Sabah Mahmoud, Charles Hirschkind and others who have pointed out that in a way these uh, uh, secular but de facto Christian ideas of religion don't do well to in a way get, get a sense uh, or, or don't do well as um, frameworks for the study of Islam. So I'm very uh, much uh, conscious of that. I also recognize the problem that the study of religion in Africa has been bifurcated. Um, Malus Janssen and I, we have been writing about that. It is very problematic and we need to move uh, beyond that. And of course, in calling in a way us from Europe to recognize our entanglements uh, with Africa doesn't mean that these are the only uh, uh, entanglements because the entanglements with the Islamic world are much older 
you know, Islam was there when Christianity came there as a mission uh, religion. So I take that point very much. And actually, uh, Reich and uh, Jan Bart, uh, Marta Friedrichs uh, and others, Samuel Tevuso, are even involved in a project, research project in Ghana that looks at the coexistence of Muslims uh, and Christians and the negotiations uh, of differences. It's quite interesting that for long, southern Ghana and even Ghanaians in the south have been claiming, oh, we are so Christian and then you have the north and that's Islamic, but it doesn't really count. This had also effects on scholarship and we are trying to uh, redress it. And then, of course, uh, we have been working closely with Ilana van Wyk and with uh, also Linda van der Kamp, uh, this whole uh, move of Pentecostalism from uh, Latin America has to be as much taken into account as the move of certain Eastern Japanese movements into Africa. For Africa is, of course, well, if, as Makamo said, if we want to understand, uh, we, we can understand the world by looking at Africa and the world is present there. So I just try to offer one um, uh, inroad into it for certain conceptual uh, reasons, since the study of religion has been so much overdetermined in a way by au fond Christian, um, uh, concepts. So that is uh, so far to my defense, but I think you have a good point and we need to really push this uh, 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 much further. And then to your question, I find that very interesting. Of course, this distinction is already part of a particular religion, secular binary and distinction that of course must be, uh, must be questions. I even wonder what really distinguishes a religious worldview from another worldview. Worldviews are attributed with value and they help people make sense of who they are, where they go, they offer cosmologies and so on. So I would say that worldviews in general have certain con connotations we often associate also with religion in the sense that they give certain uh, values and intellectual directions. So I would not make such a strong uh, boundary at all and my call to look at Africa, at religion from Africa and see religion as otherwise would very much open up for the possibilities that you um, sketched here in your short but very good question. Uh, the, the, the zeros yes. out there, but there is still, okay, there's still time. Um, I, I would particularly like to come back to the, to the question or comment by uh, Mike Kaag on uh, what, what is the Islamic uh, perspective here. And uh, I agree with you that it should go beyond paying more lip service to the idea that Islam also matters. Yes, Islam also matters, obviously. Uh, and uh, in terms of also sort of my discussion, I feel that when we want to explore, let's say, the cultural rootings of, of secularism, uh, understand secularism not as being just produced in a European context, but that there can be different cultural contexts in which particular forms of secularities emerge. And of, of course, then also the Islamic point about secularities and the Islamic production of uh, secularities becomes also immediately important of how a uh, de-centered uh, 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 perspective of Europe uh, emerges. And of course, this decentering is again not singular. There can be many different decenterings going on at, at, uh, at the same time. So in that sense, uh, your provocative question is definitely something that uh, needs to be uh, explored further. Thank you very much. Now, as you will all appreciate, it is lunchtime, but remember, it's an, there's a challenge, the energy challenge of the midday. So please don't only talk and converse, but also reset the working memory and make sure you're sort of fresh back here by two o'clock when we'll start again. <laughs>